If you haven't guessed by now, our overall theme today is witness. As I've taught through Daniel the last three or four chapters, we've gone through that to preserve the narrative of the story where there were areas that I could take side roads down and, and explore further. And witness is one of those. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were all witnesses to the greatest kingdom the greatest empire of their time, and even to Cyrus and Darius later they witnessed. And so that's our theme today. Um, and, and to that end, and it happens to be the day too that we support uh, Chaplain Ross's ministry in the Cass County Jail and wherever else God has called him to, to uh, serve. So Chaplain Ross, would you come up and give us a few minutes of what's going on in your ministry? Well, I, I know that I had, uh, I won't say a limited amount of time, but I thought it would be best if I kind of wrote something down to share with you. Before I get started, I'd like to give honor to God, to, to your church, to Pastor Andy, and to all, all of you here today. Thank you for coming, and I'm really, we're really uh feel privileged to be here and being invited here. So we, we're thankful for that. And I want to give honor to my, to my uh, wife, Sarah, and my son, Carl, for being with us. <clears throat> so, I, you know, I would just like to start by just sharing some, something that was written to us. But before that, I want to just quote you this scripture, which is very familiar to all of us. It's found in Matthew chapter 25 and verse 36. It says, Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. And I, I just want to, when I think about that, uh, it didn't say uh, I came. It said you came unto me, which is, is saying more than just coming. It's saying that you care. And I, I thank God for being here today because I'm here because you care. And I just want to read something. I, I, I'm excited about this opportunity to speak to you and to thank you for your interest to partner with us to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ to the men and women at the Cass County Jail. Because of the past COVID restrictions, which lasted for two years, we were not able to go into jail for two years. Our ministry has, has after it was re, re uh, after the sheriff gave us permission to come back in, we actually were not allowed to have uh, group uh, Bible studies like we had before in chapel services. So we had to go into the blocks, which was end up being a blessing in disguise. And so we were not, our ministry has conducted its activities in the cell blocks. This challenge, this change has still been an unexpected blessing for the ministry, and it truly has been. Cell Block Ministry provides an excellent opportunity to immediately answer inmates' questions and concerns. Many inmates also express gratitude for the more personal attention that we're able to give them. It has truly been a blessing and saving grace for them, and I'm so humbled to hear them say they look forward to us bringing, uh, coming, through, coming throughout the week. This is a letter that was written by one of the, the inmates, and uh, he actually wasn't written to me, it was written to the jail commander, and he, uh, he shared it with me. This letter was <clears throat> from, a, his name was Jeremy, a young man who wrote this letter, it was, released from, was released from Cass County Jail, and this is what he wrote back to the jail commander. I want to express my appreciation for the way Cass County Jail is operated, and the way the officers conduct themselves. It became a place of safety, restoration, and most importantly, an opportunity to hear about Jesus and his love. I was amazed and full of hope when I saw chaplains actually come into the blocks and visit with us. In my opinion, more than any other factor, that makes the jail to be a good place. It's an, it, it is the, it is 
It is the liberty that gives the it is the liberty that you give the chaplains to share the spirit of God to share Christian ch give the chaplains to share the spirit of God. Most people that end up in the jail do so because of drug related offenses. The Cass County Jail is a place when when an addict can get clean and have a real encounter with the spirit of God that enables a person to experience real change. I've been off drugs for 164 days after being released, and I'm able to re-enter re society sober and spiritually fit. I truly, truly thank you for your professionalism in allowing the chaplains access to access, the access that they have. Very respectfully, Jeremy. And I, as a uh, pastor was saying, uh, uh, I was actually speaking to uh, someone that I have, uh, I'm gonna just name brother, brother Raymond, brother Ray, as we were coming up, he was just sharing with me, uh, and I know uh, some of the history of what's been going on in the Methodist Church organization. And I, as I was, the pastor was saying, Pastor Andy was saying that we have went through some similar to that, not quite as uh, uh, probably as uh, intense, but it had, was a big change between the ministry we were in before. And so we had to felt like we could no longer support it. And especially in our community, it was things that uh, we just felt that uh, didn't fit with, uh, with the way we had been doing things. So we're glad to announce that uh, we're well on our way and we, 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 we are rebuilding, but God has been blessing. We have, been, we have just been awarded, well, actually, actually this year, I think it was uh, March, we awarded our 501c3 status. And so we had the tax exemption, which is very important if you're collecting funds, especially in the state of Michigan. And so we're thankful to, and we were, I don't know if you may, may or may not be aware that during that transition period, we uh, were partnering with another organization that will help us collect funds. It's illegal actually to do that in Michigan unless you have some sort of 501c status. So we, we were using another organization and we're, we're happy to announce that uh, actually now we're, we're gonna be able uh, to just have uh, do donors send the money, uh, whatever you wanna donate will go directly uh, to the ministry, we uh, <clears throat> I just uh, the, the organization we were able to call the Mich Central Missionary Clearing House. Now we have now we have uh, you know our new name now uh, is a new Foundation Community Jail Ministry, and we have a, a treasurer. Some of you may or may not know her. Her name is uh, Sister of Miss Christy DeRocher, and we're going to be sending out uh, information for you that you can uh, be able to donate. Now, I want to thank you again, and I know that uh, we're going to be staying. I understand that you have something after service, so we'll be staying after service. So you may have any questions. I know we, we'll, the time is limited, so if you may have any questions, I'll be happy to answer any questions that, that you might have. But I do thank God again for being here, and uh, we we'll really appreciate you, all of you inviting us. God bless you. Amen. <clears throat> Is that form that you sent out at the beginning of the year still valid? Central Missionary Clearing House? It's still valid. Okay. But we're going to be sending other information so we go into the transition. Period. Okay. In our theme of witness, we heard from Chaplain Ross this morning about the one witnessing. And now we're going to hear a testimony from my friend Pedro um, about being witness to and the change that's made in his life. Um, I met Pedro at a De Calores weekend and Robbie was there and Jared ba back there. You may notice eventually that they've got matching t-shirts, Jared and, and Pedro, so he'll tell you some about that. But anyway, brother Pedro, come on up here. Testing, testing, all right. Thank you for that introduction on piano playing, Luis. 
um, as always, I like to start in prayer, everybody. Um, before I start in prayer, let me introduce myself. My name is Pedro Rodriguez. People call me Peter, which is Pedro in English, right? Uh, so uh, let's start in prayer, everybody. Our Heavenly Father, we want to first of all, Lord, give thanks for your grace and your mercy, for we all need it, Lord. Lord, we ask you that you bless this church and bless Pastor Andy and this ministry and all the folks here in the church. Lord, bless them and any unspoken prayers. Also, Lord, a special uh, prayer, Lord, for uh, Chaplain Ross and his ministry that you've given him, put in his heart to do, Lord. I ask you also, Lord, in Jesus' name, that you uh, forgive me of any sins and forgive us all of any sins and shortcomings as we forgive others, Lord. I ask you most of all, Lord, that you put your words in my mouth and put your words in, in your spirit in my heart and that it be to glorify you as I do this witness, Lord. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. amen. All right. Uh, witness, what was that? Uh, we said earlier, uh, was it ud? Was it, what was that again? Uh, the word that they used in the Hebrew for witness? Uh, I, I, I can't pronounce it. Uh, was it odd or something like that? So I, I, I'm here to do the odd. Also, I, I want to start with a scripture, which is in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. And I'm going to take my glasses off so I can see, right? <laughs> so here we go. It says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. I'd like to share my testimony with you all. And uh, that God's been calling, I want, to, I want everybody to understand here that God's been calling everybody. God's been, if we look back at our lives, we'll realize how much God's been calling us. And uh, I like to always say that if God's calling you, there's four reasons why God's calling you. One, to have a relationship with him. Two, to glorify him. Three, he's got a blessing for you. And four, is to have eternal life. So those are the four things. You know, if you're being called, I got two daughters. When I call my daughters, I call them for a reason. I don't just say their names just to say their names, right? So I call my, for those of you who have children, I call my daughters. I got something for them to do. Some assignment, uh, some chores, or sometimes I got to give them some money. So I got to bless them with something, right? So, you know, either or I got something for them to do when I call them. So... If we all look back, and I look back at my life, I realize that God's been calling me throughout my life, lifetime. And uh, again, I said, if God's been calling you, that means you have a calling. And then the question is here, have any of us here answered that calling? And even though we've been, even though, even though we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, there's still a calling for you to do. Uh, there's a pastor in Chicago that I, that I follow, and he has a saying that says, uh, I've, I've been saved not to sit. I've been saved to serve. You know, uh, I always say that uh, being saved is uh, like being on a basketball team. I'm not, I'm not saved to sit and be a bench warmer. I, I, I want to be put in the game, you know, uh, and, and that's what all of us are called to do is something on that field, something on that court. So my testimony starts... Uh, as I want to also mention that I don't believe in uh, coincidences. I believe that God has ordained everything, everything in my life and in yours too. That it's not a coincidence that you're here for those of you who show up. I also want to thank, as I noticed the chaplain here uh, for being here. I want to thank my wife for, for coming. I want to uh, thank my, my brother Jared for coming, my nephew and my employee, my daughters and Jessica. Uh, I want to thank you. And I want to thank you, Andy, for having me here too. And all you congregation here that were willing to let me come and give Ud or the, te the witness, right? So all my life I've noticed, I sit back now and I've, I've noticed that God's been calling me the whole time. At nine years old, uh, South Bend, I was born in South Bend, Indiana, 
my mother used to take me to church called Calvary Temple. I think now it's called Southgate. And they had a youth group. I was like nine years old. And uh, a Puerto Rican friend of mine named George, I don't remember his last name, and my brother went to this youth group. And in the youth group, as they were giving, you know, they were given this event. At the end, they do the altar call. And I remember George was excited. Pedro, let's go, let's go, let's go up there. Let's go up front. And I didn't want to go. I was scared. I don't know why I was, but I was scared. Uh, uh, and it was my calling then, I noticed. And, and because I didn't go, George didn't go, and my brother didn't go. And I, want, and I want you to understand the importance of that. My calling was if I would have went, they would have had the courage to go with me. So sometimes you being called to serve Jesus and to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior will give the courage to your wife, to your, your children, to your friends. It will give them the courage to want to serve too or, or, or accept that call, answer that calling. As I, got, as I grew older and got older, according to teenager, I got in, uh, in the criminalized, criminal organization. I got involved in, 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 in drugs and in the, in the selling of drugs. And it was down in South Texas and right by the border. So uh, it's predominantly there. There's a lot of drug trafficking. Uh, uh, back then, there wasn't as the cartel wasn't as predominant as it is now. It's real bad now. But uh, uh, we were part of, 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 a, of a criminal organization, extortion, selling drugs, violence. It, it, it was pretty bad. Uh, I've, I've learned now. Because of that, I've learned, I've seen that gangs are a form of a cult. They're, they're willing to die and kill for signs and symbols, and, and, and not just for turf, because a lot of them expand to different places. But, but these men, and I was one of them, and I spent 18 years of my life in prison dedicated to something that wasn't worth nothing, you know. And the, but the thing I look back and I see now is that there's men out there that are willing to do that, to sacrifice their lives and, and, uh, for something that's nothing. And, and, and the thing I see in that, if these men are willing to do that, and I was one of them, what, would, what could they do if God used them to do it for God, to, you know, to serve God? That these men are willing to go that far you know, to do that. So, um, and, and I was one of those men, you know. I'd gotten to the situation where down south, uh, and this was years, years ago. I was like 20 years old. I'm now 55, about to be 56. And God's blessed me this, to live this long. And uh, um, it had gotten to the point where I was in a situation, me and my brother and, our, and, and the guys in our group, it was either killed or be killed. And uh, it was bad. Uh, to the point where I figured the only way I would escape being killed or having to take another man's life is to leave that area and move. I was living in South Texas, move back to South Bend, you know, up, up South. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and, and so my mother, she was really against it. My father lived, uh, I, my parents were divorced. My father lived in South Bend. My mother was down. My mother was all, since all I've, since the, since the day I can remember, my mother's been a, a lady of God always praying, witnessing to me constantly. So what I want to let you all know is that I gave my life in, when I was 49 years old. So for you fathers and mothers, don't give up the, the praying and the witnessing to your children. You, you might see that there's, it looks like they're hopeless, but that look, 49 years old, it took 49 years old for me to do it. Anyways, at this time, is my mother didn't want me to go to South Bend, so she called my uncle, one of my uncles. Most of my mother's side of the family are all men and women of God. So he came to minister to me and my brother about not leaving, and he was really trying to minister to us to give our life to Jesus Christ. And uh, he was letting us know that, uh, and this is the truth, that most gang members, the reason they carry guns and are out to kill somebody is because they don't want to be killed. They don't want to die. That's the truth of the matter. No matter how tough they are, they don't want to die. They don't want to be killed. So they'll be the first ones to, to do the violence first or kill in order to be not killed, right? Kill them, very killed. And uh, at this time, again, I was 20 years old. Now the calling was, here's the calling that, that, that the Lord was using. My uncle was to call me to Jesus. And I wasn't answering the call because I, I knew all the answers. I'm 20 years old. I know everything. You know, I'm 20 years old. They know everything, right? But, uh, uh, and I was like, no, I'm just going to move to South Bend and start all over. And, and he said something to me that when you go to South Bend, if you don't change your heart, whatever you're doing here is going to be there. And it's the truth. I, you know, I've been around long enough that uh, uh, if you're a drug addict 
in, in, in this town and, I, and they put you in Siberia, you'll be a drug addict in Siberia. If you're a, a, an adulterer in a small town like this and they put you in, in, in the southern border of Mexico, you're going to be an adulterer there. So whatever that bondage of sin you're in, it don't matter where you go. If, you're, if the heart doesn't change, sooner or later you'll be back doing the same thing, the same bondage. And that's why it was. So I, me and my brother, we didn't, again, so we didn't, accept, we didn't accept the calling of God through my uncle at that time. And I want to remind you again from the beginning that I don't believe in coincidences, all right? So uh, we left Texas, came back up to South Bend, stayed with my dad. In less than eight months, I caught a case I had taken a man's life. So I left this southern Texas so I wouldn't get involved in, a, in any type of situation where I'd have to take a life or, be, or my life be taken. And I ended up coming to South Bend and less than eight months later, there I was in the county jail. And the first thing us boys do or these men do is call mom, right? So I called mom up on the phone and let her know I'm in, I'm in jail and, and I'm in jail for this. And, and she asked me if I did it, and I really didn't want to say over the phone. And she goes, well, guess what? Your uncle, who was ministering to you that day, he's here. Again, I don't believe in coincidences. God had ordained him to be there at that time when I made that phone call. And I let him know what happened, and he was disappointed and concerned. You know, he loves me, so, he, you know, of course, he, does, he don't want to know, hear that's going. So at that time, I, I did the, the calling on prayer. I, I answered God's call on, on, on the phone. But I, I look back and I, and I did it out of uh, desperation and emotion. So as soon as I got to prison, I did end up going to prison. Of course, I, you know, I had to pay for what I'd done. I went right back to doing the, the same thing. Went back, actually got in worse. I became a gang member and when I was in prison, I became a gang leader. And uh, um, it was, I, I'll only say this, I left prison with no scratch and my only my only belief is that God protected me the whole time I was I did those 18 years while I was in prison I I had a, a I had a, 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 a priest it was I was just I was painter I, I learned to be a painter in prison I ended up I ended up going to the whole I was a bad I was pretty bad so I ended up going to like a, this pen I wanted to show you off I still have it on me maybe not but uh here we go. I ended up going to the hole for three years, and the hole was just a dark cell, no radio. You get no visits, you get no phone calls. You come out of your cell for maybe an hour to shower by yourself, and you're locked back up in the cell. It's it's it's, it's total solitary. I also remember that the death row, the people that were in trouble in death row, you got you had guys in on death row that were still committing crimes while they're on death row they were stabbing guards they were fighting with each other and they were put in this special unit where i was at and i remember my dad had come visit me and my dad of my dad was uh he was not a man of god so a lot of the things i did was to uh impress my dad or get his approval and i want to really emphasize that to you fathers out there that don't believe your sons and daughters don't seek your approval I just seek the wrong type of approval in my dad because of the, the, per, the man he was. So um, I ended up in the hole, and he had come to visit me. And usually visits were you sit at a table. It was a regular visit, like, you know, kind of we're, we're sitting here, and you have a soda pop, and you're holding hands. If it's your loved ones, you're hugging them, kissing them. Uh, uh, so when my dad came to visit me, and I was in the hall. I'm behind a piece of glass in an orange jumpsuit with a phone. So it was no contact visit. And he asked me in a little accent. Beer, what's this? And I said, yeah, Dad. I said, uh, I, I end up doing something, and uh, I'm in the hole now, and that's where I got it. And he looked at me, and, and I remember it really, really touched me when he said, even in jail, you go to jail. And he took the phone, he threw it at the, the plexiglass and walked out. And uh, that really affected me. Like, you know, wow, you know, my dad said, he didn't want to see me in jail. He wanted to see me out. He wanted me to get out, even though it's, you know, the lifestyle he lived, he wanted to see me out. So uh, after three years of being there, and then I got put in a, at administrative segregation. You got to keep in mind that I was a, and this isn't to brag, but I just kind of want to let you know where God took me from, that I'm this gang leader in prison who, who was a, uh, had a chapter in prison, and several ch I led several chapters of gangs from prison that were on the street in different locations. 
And uh, that's the power that I had at that time, where I thought I had, right? The false power of God, uh, that the Satan had me believing I had. And I remember one time, well, we were on lockdowns. Now, lockdowns consisted of, uh, uh, if there was a lockdown, let's say someone got stabbed or some violent, some violent thing happened, you would stay locked in your cell. You'd get no showers. You'd get fed twice a day. Uh, and this is what it was. You would just get fed probably like 6 in the morning, cold sack, prison food, too. A sack lunch in the morning and a sack lunch in the evening. And uh, no one comes out for nothing. No recreation. You don't get a phone call. You don't get no visits. You, the, the only thing you can hope for is get a letter. And that's a thing, too, is uh, when you're in prison, uh, you doing the chaplain, you come in to visit. Uh, it so means so much just to get that letter or that visit when you're, when you're alone like that. It, it, it does mean a lot. Uh, but I want to I go back to this pen. That when I was in the hole, this is what I got. Besides paper, I was allowed a couple books. I did have the Bible, and I would search that Bible. Now, you got to keep this in mind. My mom was always witnessing to me. So I'd get these big letters, and she was just constantly witnessing to me. And I knew when I got this big, fat letter from my mom, I said, oh, I'm going to open that in a minute. I'm not real. I know what all that is. She got a lot to say to me about my lifestyle, right? And, uh, but in prison, this, in the hole, this is what you would get, the inside of the pen. You wouldn't get a pencil because you could make a shank and stab somebody or a, a weapon with it. We call them shanks. So this is what I get. So uh, I was an artist, so I learned to draw with a pen. I had no eraser. And it benefited me to this day. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very good artist. I like to speak for myself, but one day you can see some of my work. And uh, because of this, I learned to draw without having to make mistakes with a pen like this. So it benefited me. God had a purpose for me, right? But I would study that Bible also. Keep in mind, I always study this Bible. I would always find something wrong so I can go back and tell mom, mom, the Bible this and the Bible's missed this and the, you know, just to justify, excuse me, just to justify what I was doing and how I was living because I knew the truth. A lot of us know the truth. So when we're on this lockdown one day. I'm, I'm in my cell and I'm, I'm painting now. Now I, I got at, I'm not out of the hole, so I got access to an easel, and I get to paint and everything. And uh, I hear this big commotion, and we got these little plastic mirrors. Uh, they're, like, flexible, and they're plastic, and they've uh, got, like, aluminum, so you can see yourself to shave. Of course, they won't give you glass because you can make a weapon out of it. And so I heard all this racket, so I stick my, my mirror out, out the bars to see the reflection, what's down the tier. And the commotion was, I'm like, how could anybody be fighting if there's no one out of their cells? And there's a priest, to this day we're still friends, uh, Joe Ross. He was from Notre Dame and he was in charge. I was in the state prison of uh, Indiana, Michigan, uh, in Michigan City. Actually, I got moved around a lot of prisons, like four or five different prisons, uh, because of who I was at that time. They, they didn't try to keep me in the same spot. So I, I look down, I said, oh, okay, it's a priest. And people are cussing him out and spitting on him and, you know, so I went back to painting, and he stopped by my cell. Now, even though I was who I was, I still had respect for clergymen. You know, believe it or not, as a gang leader, I respected men like you, you know. And he stopped at my cell, and uh, we became friends. And like I said, to this day, we're still friends. And uh, he would come, and I would look forward to it. You know, I would hear the cussing. Every, it was like Tuesday night. He would come and visit me and other men. And uh, we're just during the lockdown. Eventually, we did come off the lockdown. But during the lockdown, I'm, I hear cussing and yelling. I said, oh, that must be, that must be the priest. Stick the mirror out. Oh, that's him. I would have some prison coffee made for him. And we'd share a cup of coffee. And uh, he never condemned me. He never, he never said, you're going to hell if you don't get your life right. Eventually, he realized who I was. Because the prison guards and the administrators knew who I was. You know that guy is this and this. The guy you're going to talk to is this and this and this. But he was doing a, uh, that verse you quoted. He was doing that. He was, when I was sick or when I was in prison, he was coming to visit me. You know, when I was naked, he clothed me. This man was being my friend. Look, when my, when my own uncles, I got uncle as a pastor. He never wrote me a letter, never visited me. You know, I had uncles that were Christians, never visited me. The gang members quit visiting me. But this priest would still come, knowing they're going to spit on him, knowing they're going to call him every name in the book. He would come visit me and whoever other men that was willing to see him. And I would look forward to it. So that caused me to have a conviction. So what did I do? I started studying the Bible more. But now I was, I was again looking for something in the Bible, finding flaws 
to justify my unrighteous living. And so at that time in prison, there's a lot of Muslims in prison. Of course, the Muslims don't believe in the Bible. They believe in the Quran. So they were quick to, to show me scriptures, to, to go at this priest, to, uh, a form of contradictions. Now, you got to keep this in mind. I, I know I've learned the Bible now. These men aren't led by the Spirit. So to them, it's contradictions. But when the Holy Spirit leads you, you, you all know the truth. So I got, all, I got my Bible and I got all these pages looking. And here he comes. I hear him cussing. I say, yeah, it's him. So he comes. And, and we, this has been like six months later now. So we were already off the lockdown. And, you know, he's already, you know, he comes, still come visit me. And again, he could still come visit me in the regular visiting room where no one would spit on him or cuss him out. But he chose to come in, in, in the belly of the beast, so to speak, right? He'd come and visit. And that means a lot. When you get up in that cell block, so there was a blessing in that message you were talking about how they did you. That actually was, was a blessing. And uh, so I said, hey, Fa I said, Father Joe Ross, I said, uh, uh, I got, uh, I've been studying the Bible to see who Jesus is. And he was shocked. Now, you got to keep in mind, he knew that I was a gang leader in prison. He was, really? I said, yeah. I said, uh, now the Bible says this, and I'm hitting them up all these scriptures that these Muslims gave me that I found. Well, it says Jesus is this, but over here, God, this and this, and I'm hitting them all these scriptures. And uh, he's listening to me, and I said, can you show me in the Bible and tell me in the Bible, can you tell me who Jesus is? By, you know, can you clarify? And he looked at me, and I'll never forget what he says to this day. It was the most impactful thing. And I'll say this, at this time of my life, even my mom's letters wasn't reaching me. My, my heart was a heart of cement. It was, it was, it was rock. And, and, and him coming to visit me, it was like tilling the soil, getting it ready so he could plant that seed. And he says, Pedro, I don't believe in, in pointing out the Bible and telling you who Jesus is. And I want you guys to understand this, especially those men and women of God here. He says, I'd rather show you who Jesus is. And man, as soon as he said that, I just shut my Bible because that was the deepest thing I ever had anyone tell me. I'd rather show you who Jesus is. And um, when he said that, that was the day that the seed was planted in my heart. Did I give my life to the Lord? No, as I told you, uh, I did it when I was 49, it was, which was six years ago. I gave my life to the Lord. So uh, uh, I, at this time, I had, I had been already down 17 and a half years and I had been broke. Uh, denied by the pro board four times and I remember the last at the fourth time that I was to a pro board one of the ladies on the pro board said to me if it was up to me you'd never get out of prison and I was feeling doomed now keep in mind I still was not a man of God at this time I was still doing the stuff I was at, at this time I was already thinking about retiring from the gang I'd gotten so old where you could there's a certain rule in this gang that I was in that you get a certain age you can retire and uh, I, I just was tired of it you know I was just tired of it I spent 17 and a half years in prison what am I getting out of this you know and uh, so there was this boxer and I had I got moved to a different prison by Indianapolis and there was this boxer who had been in prison and grew up in the in the hood of Indianapolis and would come to minister. He wasn't he wasn't a, a pastor or ordained pastor, but he'd come to share and minister, give back to us. And uh, us thugs were quick to go see him. When, when we learned about him, who he was, because he had been where we had been, he had done what we had done, his message was more effective to us than if just any old chaplain would come in there. No offense to you, but it doesn't take away from what you're doing. But uh, uh, we all go see him. And like I said, we didn't, we didn't live it, but we'd at least go hear what he said. And he had a great testimony. He had got sent to prison, got, got 90 years and did three years. The Lord got him out. And I remember him saying that he, he, his boxing skills helped him get out. And that he said that he don't believe that the Lord got him out for boxing. The Lord got him out to glorify him. You know? And again, like I was saying, uh, uh, if, you, if the Lord's been calling you, there's four things he's been calling you. One is to have a relationship with him. One to glorify him, one to give you a blessing, one to have an eternal life with him. So to glorify him is one of them. And uh, I had been denied, like I said, this man didn't know who I was. I was just another face out in the pews. He never got to talk to me. He never knew who I was. And there was a, I was dead, sitting in the pews and I was feeling doomed. Like, man, I got 17 and a half years in. I still got another 13. And I'm just going to be a career criminal when I get out. That's, that's it. That's what I'm going to be. I was thinking about retiring from the gang, but you know what? I'm going to go full fledged when I get out and just 
I'm going to do, I'm going to be the Al Capone. And uh, I was just feeling hopeless, doomed. And again, I don't believe in coincidences. He was preaching in the middle of his preaching. He stopped and he said, you, you won't get out of, you're going to get out of prison. You're going to have a family and you're going to become successful. And then he said that to someone else and he went back to preaching. And at that time, because I respected that this man was a man of God. And I said, is God talking to me through him? A couple of months later, I made parole and I was out. And yes, I have a family. And yes, I'm successful. But I want to say something what he said. I don't believe that's the reason God let me out. God let me out to glorify him. Yes. You know? So uh, I got out. And uh, I met a party friend. It was this girl named Alexis. And I, and I got to give her her props. And uh, she was not a godly girl. And all of a sudden, like four years no, after knowing her, she, be, she became a, she gave her life to the Lord, became a, it was like a light switch. The Lord like just transformed her like a light switch. She was, she had become a menace, a, 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 a mission, joined the missionary. She was on fire for God, a totally opposite person who she'd become. And, uh, at this time I wasn't married. Me and my wife got married six years ago, but we've been together like 14 years. And I don't know, I might even be wrong about that. I always tell everybody, if your husband can tell you the exact if you, ask, if you ask a man's husband, this is what I would say. If you, ask, if you ask a woman's husband how long you've been together and he can tell you 20 years, 8 months, and, and 3 days, man, that man's doing time. That's what he's doing, right? So, uh, you know, I don't know exactly about 14, 15 years we've been together, but we've been married 6 years. And uh, she got tired of my womanizing. I, I had already left the gang and, and got tired of my womanizing. Again, uh, uh, the Lord was calling me and he did, he used this time he used to convict me was a Jehovah witness, not the doctrine, but he used them at a door, knocking on the door. I answered the door. It's two Jehovah witnesses. I like the fact that they come and knock on your door and ready. They got the passion to do that. That's something we should learn from them. And uh, I let them in and you know, they're, I'm here. I'm hearing, humoring them by listening to them. Actually, we became friends, uh, Randy, we've become friends to this day. He don't come around me no more because his wife said to him one day, look, this is working for him. There's a change in him. So he didn't like that, that, that I found Jesus and, and, uh, it's not a through Jehovah witness that it was an effect. It was affecting his wife and family. So he kind of backed off from me because I guess, so if you're walking in the spirit, the Holy Spirit, you'll be, you'll be protected by certain, by certain ones and certain things. And uh, I remember one time, and this is right, bef this be right before my wife left me. Uh, again, I was a bad man. I was a womanizer. I might have been good, to, so to speak, good. I can't, I, this is what I'll say. You can't be a good father until you're a godly father. Amen. That's, 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 you can't be a good husband until you're a, a, a godly husband. Amen. And I tell these young people, if you're looking for a wife, then you want to find a godly wife. You're looking for a husband. You want a godly, not just a good one. You want a godly husband. There's a big difference between a good husband and a godly husband. Of course, I wasn't at that time. And I was smoking a blunt with my babysitter. And I got the, my kids running around and uh, her kids running around. And uh, it was the back door. And my back door has, uh, at this time where we're living, had windows. So you could see, if you're at the back door, you could see me. I was in the kitchen. And uh, the house is just covered with smoke marijuana smoke and uh, uh, I'm exposing my, my, my kids to this you know and uh, I hear door knocking ah oh, it's Randy this Jehovah Witness with other people and man my house is just covered in marijuana smoke and I gotta let him in because he see me he's there smiling like that guy man I said and there's no way I'm gonna disguise this smoke I said I gotta go let him in so I'm gonna let him in I put the blunt out first of all I'm mean, just walking over blunt he comes in there and you he can't help but notice it and he smiles and he says, and like I say, he'd been coming to visit me periodically. And he'd say, Pedro, you love your daughters, don't you? I said, yeah, I love my daughter. He goes, you don't want to see your daughters go to hell? And I didn't even know how to answer that. Because if I said I didn't want to see my daughters going to hell, why was I exposing them to what I was exposing them to? So it was a hard answer. He knew what he was doing and the Lord used him to convict me. And it wasn't much longer that my wife just got tired of me and left me. And that was a devastating blow because I had, at this time, I had 
uh, to the point I, I was owning two businesses. I had money. I had uh, in the town that I'm in. I live in Niles. I'm pretty well popular. Uh, women chasing me. I thought I had everything. And then when my wife left me, it was really a humbling experience. My pride it fell. You know, before well, this before fall come, you know comes pride. And that's when I called this girl up, Alexis. Hey, I'm thinking, well, let me talk to this Christian girl because I've seen her, you know, some change. That was like the only Christian I can go to at that time. And she had me uh, call uh, who I'm now part of the church is that relevant church in Niles, uh, Pastor Muta, uh, African pastor. And uh, I just want to plug him like that. But uh, he's all American now. He's Americanized. I, I took joke. I said, you ain't no African. You Americanized. <laughs> and uh, I called him and I, I answered God's call then. I truly answer God called. That was in April six years ago. I got baptized April 30th. Uh, uh, that's when I made that final, that fi answer, that final call. And uh, uh, haven't gone back since. Uh, um, like I said, I believe, I, I believe that's, that's what uh, uh, my calling. And again, keep in mind that even though any of you here have already answered that call, there's another calling for you. Like I said, when I call my daughter, Ava, come here doesn't mean I'm just calling her just to call her. I got an, either an assignment for her or I might have a blessing. Here's some money. You want, you want to go to the skate park? You want to go to the, you know, skating? Here's some money. So, and that applies to all of us here, that we all have a calling to do. Yes, we do. You know, and uh, everyone has a different one. And I just ask you guys to think about this. For those of you who, have, who has not even accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, are you willing to accept that calling? And for those of you who have accepted Jesus, are you willing to accept the calling or what he has called you to do? Because there's something for you to do. There's an assignment. There's something for you to do. So I leave you with that, that if you haven't been called or you haven't answered that calling, I, 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 I urge you, especially you men, to, to take that calling because there's something called for you to do besides the fact that God's promising you eternal life. He wants a relationship with you for you to glorify him. You know, so these are the callings. Again, I, I got to say another thing real quick and I, before I end this. And uh, uh, me and a, a, a few brothers, and they were from different churches. Uh, we, we started this group called SICK, which is acronym for Soldiers in Christ. And uh, the mission statement, I'm going to read you the mission statement to tell you what this is really about. It's an army of men who are willing to give their lives in Christ to serve and become better husbands, fathers, sons, brothers, and men for our family, for the church, for the community and Christ, as it states in the Bible. We are to set an example of a man's true purpose in Christ Jesus. And that's the thing is that we have a, a saying in prison. If you're scared, go to church. And I want to do is, I want the Lord to use me to reverse that saying that scared men don't go to church, that soldiers go to church, you know, and soldiers serve Christ. You know, it takes more, it takes more courage to serve Jesus and to lay your life down for Jesus than it does to do anything else. And that was one of the reasons I was scared to do it. So that's where I leave you all. And I thank you for hearing this message and I'm going to give this back to Pastor Andy again I want to thank you Pastor Andy for having me here and uh, God bless you all and I'll be seeing all you guys to, uh, at the at the potluck Keep in mind how many witnesses it took to get Pedro to that point. How many that may have witnessed and not seen the fruit of their efforts. Paul had said that not one man plants another waters and it's up to God to make it grow. And that's our, that's our calling, to plant that seed.